ビデオ There are three letters you need to know if you really want to dive deep into the world of retro anime. O, as in original, V, as in video, and A, as in animation. O, V, A. Once a staple of anime culture, its relevancy in the grand scheme of fandom hasn't so much slipped as it has fallen off the edge of a cliff to the jagged rocks below. What the OVA means in today's context is those little bonus episodes you get when you be a good consumer and buy the DVD box sets of the series instead of pirating it. Said bonus episodes usually involve bathing suits or a hot springs resort in some shape or form. Either that or porn. Lots of porn. But for the time between the 80s and the 2000s, the OVA market was the home for a specific type of anime. The anime that couldn't get through standards and practices to be broadcast on national TV, but also had too much plot that could be reliably crammed into a feature film. It was a type of media format that was perfect for its time. In the early 80s, the VCR was becoming a widespread fixture amongst Japanese homes. Coinciding with this was the animation industry growing in monumental proportions via a combination of monster hits such as Mobile Suit Gundam and the emergence of the early otaku culture. Add to that the growing 80s bubble economy to that mixture, and you have yourself a climate for which the OVA format needed to develop. People wanted, nay demanded more anime, and it was up to the industry to figure out what would be an anime to give to the masses via direct-to-video. There were a couple of false starts in getting the first direct-to-video anime out the door, the most notable of which was an adaptation of Osamu Tezuka's The Green Cat. Anime historians do not count it as the first OVA, as there's no evidence it was readily available on VHS at the time of release, and also because it's unfinished. Oh no, the first true OVA goes to this title. Beginning as a concept for a TV series to compete with Sunrise's Gundam, Dallas was the collective brainchild of then recently founded Studio Piero. Its start as an OVA began when the producers realized there was no way something like Dallas could ever get on terrestrial broadcast, nor did the team really have the desire to make it a feature film due to its length and budget. So the staff at Piero decided to just bite the bullet and be the first ones out of the gate to capitalize on this brand new home video market that was taking Japan by storm. After a stumbling launch on December 16th, 1983, in which the marketing company released Part 2 first instead of Part 1, the series began to catch fire amongst the burgeoning crowd of anime fans, getting to a point where the final installment ranked second on the home video charts right after making Michael Jackson's thriller. Dallas is an anime that can never truly be forgotten. And why would it? It's a work that has etched itself permanently in the storied archives of anime's history. Not only was it the first OVA that helped kick off the home video market that would define the 1980s alongside titles like Dream Hunter Rim, Megazone 23, and Fight Xer 1, but it also has recognition through its noteworthy director screenwriter team. The main screenwriter was Hisayuki Toriyumi, a veteran of Tatsunoko Productions. Toriyumi's most significant achievement was directing the Science Ninja Team Gachaman anime. He broke away from Tatsunoko in 1979, and after a brief stint working for Sunrise, he wound up being one of the founders for Piero. But it would be Toriyumi's protege who would take most of the spotlight regarding Dallos, both as a screenwriter and a director. Second only to Hayao Miyazaki, Mamoru Oishi is one of the most internationally recognized anime directors ever. While he's more well known for his landmark cyberpunk film Ghost in the Shell, anime historians have called 1983 Oshi's breakout year. Not only is he helming the biggest anime on television at the time, as well as making his film debut with a movie based on said TV anime, but here he is making history with the first OVA. So Dallas is a historically important anime, both for the medium as a whole and as an important part of an acclaimed director's legacy. But there's a lingering question. What is Dallos actually about? Despite its place in animation history, the people who actually have seen and discussed the anime are very few. People may know what Dallos is, but they don't really know what Dallos is. 
Up until Discotech brought the series over uncut a few years ago, the only true official release we had over here in the States came in the form of a heavily edited version retitled Battle for Moon Station Dallas, and that was it. So it can't be forgiven that Dallas is less remembered as an anime and more as a trivia question. But perhaps it shouldn't be that way. Maybe there is value in Dallas that we may not see at first glance. What exactly is that value? Well, let's take a look. Now, I'm not really going to touch on the technical stuff for this anime because there's not really much to go on. The character designs are a fascinating study of the transition between 70s designs and 80s designs. Plus, there's some attention to detail that's actually quite impressive, such as how the animation team makes a crowd scene full of diverse faces and body types rather than use the same character models over and over again or the way bullet casings are ejected from the guns in a more upward fashion to showcase the effects of a lower gravity setting. But there's really not much that differentiates the animation between this and what we would see on TV. The only noticeable element separating Dallas between it and the average currently airing mecha show is that Dallas can show us things like this. <laughs> Since this is a Mamoru Oshi joint, you would expect to see some of his signature directing style with emphasis on telling a story through mostly visuals. But you have to remember, Dallos was produced back when Oshi was still honing and perfecting his craft as a director. We really wouldn't see the results of what would define him as a director until a year later with Urusei Yatsura 2, Beautiful Dreamer. Therefore, if you come to Dallas hoping to witness Oshi's signature style in action, you might be a little disappointed. Not that it's completely bereft of Oshi's style, it does have some of his trademarks such as opening the anime with a big climactic action scene, here being an extended police chase. Certain scenes also feel like they would be later perfected in other Oshi works. And there are one or two scenes that perfectly encapsulates his style of slow, dark melancholy, such as this scene of a post-battle montage of a revolutionary commander trying to contact his comrades over scenes of a silent, ruined battlefield. Gyorugu. But these scenes are too few and far between to really make Dallos stand out. So once again, there's very little to differentiate between Dallos and an anime one could see on TV. So with all of this in mind, it may seem like Dallos was just an unremarkable anime, only noteworthy for the market made on anime history and nothing more. But slow this bird down, because there is something that makes Dallas remarkable, and it will be what we're going to mainly focus on in this video. Its story. Here's a brief plot summary. In the near future, humankind has exhausted the Earth of its resources. To sustain Earth's populace, mining colonies are established on the moon to make up for the loss of resources on planet Earth. Years of labor have ensured the Earth federal government sees the colonists as nothing more than just glorified slaves. The colonists respond by performing acts of terrorism, leading directly to a conflict with the overseers. The only thing that gives the colonists hope for the future is the mysterious structure known as Dalos. No one knows its origins, but its power is mysterious, and the colonists have begun to worship it as if it were a god. The focal point of the story is colonist Shun Nonomura. He will be our Amuro Rei for the evening. Shun is an average colonist caught up in the clashes between the revolutionaries led by Dog McCoy and the Earth Federation forces led by the tyrannical commandant Alex Riger. He will be our char Enzabel for the evening. Judging from this brief summary, it could be easy to dismiss this as just another sci-fi anime. In fact, the original producers were not shy in admitting that the original goal of making Dallas was to outdo Gundam. But, disregarding all that, there's still a lot of ambition behind the story. Dallos, after all, was not a story that was designed to sell toys in the first place like Gundam was. It was an entirely original story born without the limitations and expectations of sponsors. Oshi himself has remarked that it would be exceptionally difficult to get a story like Dallos off the ground, even today. And what ultimately makes Dallas stand out from all the toyetic mecha series at the time is its themes. The plot and its themes kick off by having Shun be separated from his friend Rachel, who will be our Frau Bao for the evening, and winds up getting arrested. But as soon as he is arrested, he is also soon rescued by the revolutionaries. Shun, while grateful for the revolutionaries' help, is very wary about trusting them. Exasperating this issue is the friendship Shun strikes up with Melinda Hearst, 
an important Federation figure who is both the Revolutionary's hostage as well as the fiancé of Riger. She will be our Sela Mas slash Lala's son for the evening, I guess? Anyways, she's an idealist who believes that there are some good people within the Federation, and is the reason why Shun believes that maybe it is possible that the system works, and that the Federation will listen to the colonists' grievances. This conflict in which Shun is torn between taking up arms against the non-just system, or hoping the system will work out in the end, ties into the main theme of how revolutionary activity affects everyday people. Dalos is a much smaller scale story than the concept would let on. It's not so much about a war than it is about the lives of people affected by that war. There's no real larger than life personas on display here, nor are there black and white good versus evil narratives. The whole conflict is painted with various shades of grey. The revolutionaries are shown to be justified in their cause by having the government monitor the colonists like actual criminals and won't even allow them the dignity of having funerals for their bodies, preferring to have their corpses chemically dissolved until only the rings around their head remain. But they're also shown to be stubborn, overly idealistic, and utilizing methods that put their fellow colonists in harm's way. The government forces are shown to be jackbooted thugs, with their leader Riger even being condemned by his own superiors as an iron-fisted tyrant. But Riker thinks of his methods as a necessary evil. To him, these tyrannical methods are the only way to beat the revolutionaries, and he ends up being 100% correct when his army curb stops them in the climactic battle, only coming to a truce when Dallas ends up making the battle a draw. And even when that happens, Riker upholds his end of the truce, and even by the end appears to understand, or at least begin to understand, why the revolutionaries fight in the first place. There's even conflict amongst the colonists, specifically the conflict between the first generation colonists like Shun's grandfather and second generation colonists such as Dog. The first generation colonists, who suffered the most trying to get a sustainable lunar colony up and running in the first place, still have loyalty to the Federation. While they are not blind to the mistreatment they have received from them, they still want to believe that the Federation recognizes the sacrifices they made to ensure Earth stays alive. They see Dog and his generation's methods as hasty, that things haven't gotten that bad where they need to resort to violence. In fact, the most revolutionary act they are willing to do is formally declare a labor strike. Dog, meanwhile, is part of the second generation, the people who were children when the lunar colonies were first established. People who still have lingering memories of Earth, but were uprooted to be forced into a life of what they see as nothing more than slavery they get paid for. They are the ones with the demands and the reason to fight. And in between this internal conflict are the young people such as Shun and Rachel, the third generation. Colony life is all they've ever known. To them, Earth is just a place that exists in photographs and storybooks. They have no attachments to the place their parents and grandparents once called home. And ultimately, it will be up to them to decide the course of the future, whether they should place their faith in an unjust system or take up arms against it. So, how does Dalos execute these themes? Okay, in order to fully discuss how Dalos handles its own themes, I'm going to be spending a lot of time spoiling the ending. So. If you have any desire to go see Dallas without any big spoilers, now's the time to hop overboard. So here's how Dallas ends. With the revolutionaries crushed and the Federation forced into a draw by Dallas' attack on them, both sides organize a temporary ceasefire and the colonists proceed to go back to their daily routine of working in the mines as if nothing has happened. Riker decides to grant Shun's whisk of taking his dying grandfather to see the Sea of Nostalgia, a place he wants to visit for one last time. Traveling across the moon's surface towards the Sea of Nostalgia, Shun sees for the first time the suffering the first generation of settlers had to face, and then they finally reach their destination. From the vast cemetery that serves as the final resting place of countless settlers, Shun's grandfather finally gazes out at planet Earth and finally passes away looking at the place he once called home. 
With the passing of his grandfather, along with witnessing the sacrifices the settlers had made for the ungrateful people of Earth, Shun makes his decision. And so the OVA ends with Shun looking out on Earth as an audio broadcast from Earth plays, pledging that any rebellion from the colonists will be stopped at all costs. Now for those of you who ignored my warning and decided to plow on ahead anyway, you might be thinking, wait, that's how the anime ends? It feels more like a setup for a story rather than its own story. What a ripoff. And you would be justified in thinking that. You can't ignore that Dallas feels more like a prologue than a complete story. Even the characters in story acknowledge the kind of shaggy dog nature of the final episode. Hey, Tom. But remember what I said a few pages ago? That this is not a story about a war, but how a war affects the lives of the people surrounding it? So wouldn't it make sense that the story would end at the point where the character we've been following throughout this OVA makes the decision on which side he chooses in this war? This is the true climax of Dalos, not the Battle of Dalos that takes place in the end of Part 3 and the start of Part 4, but Shun finally making his decision of who he will fight for at the end of Part 4. It fits with the main theme of choosing sides in a conflict that you don't fully understand. Sure, the Rebels resort to terrorism that leads to collateral damage, and sure, you have friends on the Federation side who will vouch for you and your people, but when you finally see the extent of how much your people fought for only to be spat in the collective face by their Earth superiors, it suddenly becomes an easy decision to make. There's only one thing that weakens the story and its themes, and that thing is Shun Nonomura. I understand why Shun does not make a decision up until the very end. If he made a decision right before the big battle of Dallos, it would make most of Part 4 feel like pointless meandering. But throughout the OVA, Shun's indecisiveness affects his character in a negative way. For most of the OVA, he is being yanked around by both sides, either arresting him, lecturing him, chasing him, and only really taking any action if someone on either side forces his hand. All of this being broken up with him saying something along the lines of, I don't know man, I'm just going with the flow, that's all. Yeah. This makes him come off as either an underwritten blank slate at best, or an irresolute dumbass at worst. The most egregious example being when the OVA starts shifting the shades of grey to have the rebels be on the lighter side by having the Federation forces completely firebomb Shun's village to flush him and the rebels out, ultimately killing both his mother and Rachel's parents. This is the event that radicalizes Rachel and ultimately puts Shun on the spot saying that the Federation thinks of his people as completely disposable. So, what does he have to say when Rachel confronts him with this fact? He completely changes the subject and dodges the question. <laughs> and not only that, this moment kind of undermines the whole choice narrative of the piece. Centrism does not make for compelling thematic storytelling, it is no. But when you have these kind of moments where the camera shows one side is obviously more in the wrong than the other, the question stops being what side will Shun choose and starts becoming when the hell is Shun gonna nut up and join the rebels already? It's a flawed narrative where our protagonist is surrounded by people with clearer motivations and agendas and it ultimately hinges on the fact that he doesn't get his own goals until the very end, ultimately leading into a potentially greater story that we, the audience, will never see. It's hard not to come away from Dallas without feeling a little unimpressed by it. If you come in looking for Sakuga tier animation, you'll be disappointed. If you come in looking for high levels of 80s OVA style violence, you'll also be disappointed. If you come in looking for an awesome sci-fi action story, you're definitely going to be disappointed because the ending will make you want more. 
there's nothing mind-blowingly good about Dallos, but at the same time, it's not offensively bad, or even painfully mediocre. It's... alright. It's a good example of the potential for OVAs, the ability to tell deeper, less toyetic stories regardless of how flawed they may be, no longer having to worry about restrictions such as broadcast standards or sponsors' notes. A story like this where the focus is purely on the lives of everyday people rather than the battles surrounding them would never make it to air. It only would have made sense to put it in the home video market. Without a story like this, we might have never gotten classic OVAs that also would have never made it to terrestrial broadcast. Something had to be the first step. And that first step was Dallas.